Hey guys, welcome to my channel. I'm Daniel, and in this vlog, I guess you call it, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I kind of learned D&D &D and how I think it's super interesting even today uh, to go back to that resource, which is actually Mulvey Basic, as they say, or BX, or Basic, um, 1981 Basic. It's called a lot of different things, right? Uh, the Basic D&D &D kind of had a few different uh, versions uh, that came out over the years. This is the one, there's the actual book that I learned on. And I mentioned this before that I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons or played, started playing when I was nine years old. And this is what I learned on. Uh, the summer uh, when I was nine years old, I saw my older siblings uh, playing a game that was being run by my an older cousin. Um, and it was just fascinating to me to listen to this, you know. Um, and then I didn't really think about much again until my friend, my next door neighbor, Stephen Hill, got a uh, the basic book and then I eventually got it for Christmas too but and we taught ourselves how to play D&D &D by reading the books nobody taught us how to play I see this a lot where, where there's this kind of thing where people talk about well you know back in the day you know you would the way the only way you could learn because it was so complicated was somebody else knew how to play and they taught you you know we taught ourselves and this book is how we did it and many of the things that I learned there influence how I play today and in fact when I came back to D&D it was playing 5th edition, and I felt like certain things didn't react the same way to me, didn't feel the same. I eventually went back and bought this, and I haven't had this all the time. I went and bought one eBay um, and started reading this, and it really it, it opened my eyes again to how we used to play. So I want to kind of come through and read what seems to be simple. It's one page. Uh, I mean, there's a few different examples in the book, so I might do more videos, but uh, this is one page, page 28, and this is the example of combat. And I think that uh, an example like this shows you the heart of how the game should be played and it makes you understand it much more than any rules could uh could happen and i guess the, the good thing about these days you can watch people play live and by the way a little plug here we're we're running a, a bx a kind of a version of bx on mondays at 7 uh, eastern and i'm running astonishing swordsman sorcerers of hyperborea uh, at 7 p.m eastern on fridays so if you're interested in watching people play join us because that's super fun but anyways Let's, I have a PDF of the rule book, and I'm just going to kind of read through this, and I'm going to tell you my impression of it and what I learned from it. And you can tell me if you think what I'm saying is accurate or if I'm just crazy, because I know I'm at least a little bit crazy, right? So, um, all right, so let's take a look at the screen. Okay, so this is our example of combat. I mean, some of it is whatever, you know. Uh, four players, Morgan Iron Wolf, Morgan Iron Wolf, for you BX people, uh, Silverleaf, Frederick, Sister Rebecca, they enter this, this room. Um, there's a secret door. Um, that was discovered by the elf. The room appears to be empty, and while they're searching, a second secret door, which they did not find, uh, opens, and the first of 12 hobgoblins, the first pair of 12 hobgoblins walks in. So now we're basically about to enter combat, right? This is, this is what it feels like. So, secret doors, dead ends, monsters using them. This is basically, uh, I would imagine, right, a wandering monster, which I think I'll do another video about, because I feel like wandering monsters get a lot of, uh, bad press that they shouldn't, but... Let's get into this. So the DM checks for surprise. Uh, the party rolls two, the hobgoblin one. Both sides are surprised. So this means that, well, it says, the two groups stare at each other while uh, changing their order into a better defensive position. So basically, they can't. Uh, it, technically, you can't attack. You, I, I think technically in the rules, you can't do anything when you're surprised. But because the their both sides are surprised, the DM is allowing, right? So already it's rulings over rules, allowing people to shift their positions even though they're surprised, right? Um, since Silverleaf is the only member of the party who speaks Hobgoblin, right? Uh, the other characters elect him as their spokesman. Uh, the player who runs Silverleaf becomes the caller. Now, if you don't understand BX, uh, there's a there's generally when you're going through the dungeon, there's uh, something called the caller, which again, maybe I'll do a video about the caller too, but. It's a person that kind of goes, we go left, we go right, you know, they're in charge. We're going to check these rooms. They kind of speak for the group um, so that everybody's not just shouting at the DM constantly until usually until you break into combat, then everybody does their own thing. Um, but all of a sudden, now Silverleaf, so a character with a special ability, in this case speaking the language of, of Hobgoblin, is getting highlighted, right? So this tells me that uh, each, each player... Uh, can contribute in their own way to the situation, right? Here's here's somebody who has the hobgoblin language, so all of a sudden they become really important. Um, so um, he quickly warns the others that he's about to use his sleep spell, okay, which makes sense. Um, so Silverleaf step forward, 
with both hands empty in token of friendship and says, uh, Greeting, noble dwellers of deep caverns. Can we help you? <laughs> just in case, Silverly is thinking of the words to casting a sleep spell. So, you know, that's just a little... Now, this is a super important thing that exists in OSR type games and doesn't really, at least mechanically, exist in the newer editions as far as I know, at least not 5e. Um, and I think this is what sets the exploration type of uh, dungeon crawl away from let's full-on combat. Because note, hobgoblins, which are generally bad guys, right, have come into this room where the players are invading. The, the DM didn't shout roll initiative, right? We're, we're role-playing, we're interacting with these hobgoblins. He's actually giving Silverleaf a plus one on the reaction roll. Now, reaction rolls are key. I'm just going to jump off the page for a second here. Um, so the reaction table is really a key part of these OSR-type games. Essentially, what it means is... I'm going to find it, of course. Um, so essentially, what it is is... Oh, there it is. Uh, right here, monster reactions. So what this is, is that whenever you encounter a creature that's not preset to, like, let's say, attack you, I mean, sometimes a module might say, this creature attacks everything that walks by, you're going to roll on this table, right? So when you're rolling your wandering monsters, or even just the hobgoblins are in the room having drinks, how are they going to react? What's their disposition towards anybody entering the room at this moment, one way or the other? Okay, so this is super important because, again, we didn't just shout roll initiative, right? The game is, and I know I've heard this a lot, people are like, oh, all you do is fight. It, this is right away teaching me, you don't just attack and kill everything. We try to talk to the hobgoblins, especially when there's only four of them and there's 12 hobgoblins. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, DM rolls. Unfortunately, the DM rolls a four. And if you look at this table, uh, our monster reaction table, if you notice, only a two, so you're rolling 2d6 here. Only a two is that they'll immediately attack you. So the chance of them immediately attacking you is very, very low. Enthusiastic friendship is a 12, which is also very low. Kind of in the middle is uncertain, right? That gives you a chance. Hostile, possible is right below that. And then, of course, no attack leaves or considers offers. So, unfortunately, you know, Silverleaf in the group is not super lucky because um, the DM rolls a, uh, a four, which is modified to a five, which is still at the at reaction of hostile, right? Uh, the hobgoblins draw their weapons and more of them enter the room, right? Two aside, step in, two more step in. The hobgoblin, the largest of them shouts, clearly the leader, go away, you're not allowed in this room. So again, they're not, they're hostile, they're not attacking. Okay, so then Silverleaf replies, it's okay, Gary sent us. Now I must admit, I had no idea who Gary was when I was nine years old. I understand it's probably Gary Gygax now, but this tells me it's kind of quirky and fun and weird, right? I think it's super interesting, right, that they did that. And in fact, the Hobgoblin says, huh? And now we're rolling another reaction roll. What does this teach us? The the players encounter the monster, you roll their initial reaction. They interact with the with the monster in some way. You roll it again, right, to see, like, how this is affected. And you can be give them bonuses or penalties based on what went on. In this case, he's not giving him nothing. That was, you know, the Hobgoblin doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, okay. So at this point, he rolls a three. Now, now again, three is hostile, it may attack, and at this point, they, they pissed him off, right? So now we roll initiative. Okay, so we're already into this. We're role-playing, we're seeing these Hobgoblins, we're making a plan. Now we roll initiative, uh, DM rolls a two, it's side initiative in BX. Uh, Silverleaf rolls a four. Um, Silverleaf has already warned the others he's going through a sleep spell. Right? So they move behind him so they don't get hit by the sleep spell. This is actually one of those really interesting things because if you follow BX or you on any of the forms, the sleep spell never says what the area effect is, if it will hurt friendlies, any of that. But this makes it clear, at least to me, that they you can't pick who you want to put to sleep. The spell just goes out in front of you, right? So um, Morgan has a short bow ready, Frederick got his axe ready, Sister Rebecca is pulling out a mace. So she's basically a melee fighter, right? So, uh, let's see. Oh, since Morgan has her bow ready and Frederick has his axe, they choose their targets, they attack. This is just how to do it, the actual math of it, right? Um, but this is interesting. They both hit their targets. And what we get here, which is different in old school games versus, let's say, modern games. And actually, I see a lot of people doing this to speed things up, and I, I hate this. The idea that, like, monsters should just have a fixed number of hit points. Orcs have five hit points. But I like randomness in the hit points. And, and what I do, and what I understand... 
was the way that people used to do it, because I see it in old articles, is that I don't actually roll the monsters at points until they get hit. So you don't have to, for every room, roll 12. I, you wouldn't roll 12 hobgoblins right now. You would just roll my second hit. Uh, all right, so one of them kills one hobgoblin with four hit points. The other one does five damage, but that hobgoblin has seven. Now Silverleaf casts his spell, um, and it drops 13 levels of the monsters. So man, sleep is powerful. Now we'll point out that I think this is actually a, the wrong interpretation of the sleep spell, <laughs> because if you read it, the, the one hit die monster should be treated as one. So actually, you probably should have knocked them all out. But you know, this this is the the age of not being you know computers and uh, so connected in the way it is now. I think that probably would have got caught. But anyways, in any case, a bunch of hobgoblins drop. Once that happens, right? At least half of them are out of, are out of action. So the DM decides to rule morale. Morale is another really, really important... It is an optional rule. It's right here, actually. But it's a really, really important thing when you, we talk about uh, old-school D&D. The morale is basically... The, the idea is that not everybody wants to fight till the end. And I, I get that you can just decide as a DM, oh, well, they'll run. But this gives you some kind of a, a basis for it. I mean, you can still decide not to use it and just have them run when you want. But the DM decides is going to roll the morale. You know, how, how are these guys going to keep fighting? Or are they going to give up? Uh, but because it was such a devastating first round, uh, the the hobgoblin morale, which is normally nine, is going to be lowered by one. Again, DM making a ruling. There's no place that uh, that necessarily states that it should go down by one at exactly this moment. The DM is making that ruling. At least as far as I know, there's not. If there's a place that tells you that somewhere in this book, uh, go ahead and and, uh, and and tell me in the comments here. Um, I mean, they definitely say that that you can adjust it, right? Somewhere. Yeah, adjustments. Uh, monster morale can be adjusted based on the the situation. So here we are. Use um, you know, uh, right? They're losing the battle, so it may be adjusted uh, my by minus one. So you know they're losing the battle. Half their numbers out. It doesn't say specifically half their number. It just says you can do it. Uh, okay, cool. Second round of combat. Party loses initiative. Whoosh. Another two hobgoblins charge through the doorway. Since Morgan still has her bow out. She may shoot at the charging monsters. This is absolutely not in the rules, right? They want initiative. The monsters should go first. But the DM is making a ruling. He's going, well, yeah, they're going to charge forward, but you're going to get your bow pointed at them. You can definitely get a shot off before they get to you. And he lets the player shoot their arrow. Um, okay, and he also says, you know, the other players have time, the other characters, I guess, have time to get their weapons out because there's enough time. So again, that's the DM making that ruling. Um, he does tell Silverleaf, though, or she, I guess, uh, that if they go to cast a spell and the Hobgoblins attack him, he's going to lose it, because that's part of the rules, right? So he's like, nah, nah, no way, I'll pull my weapon out, right? Uh, Morgan rolls, even though he gave her the shot with the bow, she, she missed. Uh, the Hobgoblins attack uh, Frederick and Morgan. Hobgoblins attacking Frederick rolls a 17, right? And does 8 points of damage. Fedrix only has six hit points. He's killed. Why is that important, right? This is super important to me, and I think that some people miss past this. And you get this a lot, actually, at AD&D, too, when they give exam uh, examples of play. They almost always have somebody get killed in the party. And I think this helps set expectations. This, to me, is one of the reasons why, when I'm playing D&D and my character dies, I don't go... Oh, it's tragic, which, you know, uh, can be a, a play style where people just don't expect it. In, in, in games that say, your character is the hero of the campaign, blah, 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 they don't say you're going to live forever, but they kind of imply that you, you're, you're, you're somewhat invincible. Um, it changes the way people play. If you know your character can die by a simple wandering monster with one attack and a really good roll, you're going to play differently. You know, if you can, that's why they try to talk to them first. But poor Frederick goes down. Although when we do the other um, one, you'll see that the Frederick, you know, whatever. Um, anyways, uh, Morgan also gets hit, but she does not go down. Um, she actually uh, takes four points of damage. It's not enough to kill her. So she's wounded pretty grievously, actually. Uh, and she's already attacked this round, right? Because the DM let her go first. So she just doesn't get to attack now. It's like, even when it's the party's side. Um also, keep in mind too that the D no, you know, the DM's letting these through these hobgoblins a little bit at a time, right? 
which makes sense. Um, in any case, but he does say you can change your weapon. You have enough time for that. You know, you shot the arrow. They come charging at you. You pull out your sword while before the next round. Sister Rebecca and Silverleaf get to attack, though. They kill one hobgoblin. Party gets, oh, party gets initiative for the next round. Again, we're in round three, right? So party gets initiative for the third round. Uh, all of them choose to attack the only monster in the room. There's only one hobgoblin currently in the room because the rest of the hobgoblins haven't gone yet. Rebecca and Silverleaf both miss, but Morgan, who has drawn her sword, if you remember, she rolls four for damage and kills, uh, uh, she hits the hobgoblin, uh, who has five hit points, but she's got great strength, so she gets a plus two, so she does six points of damage, basically. Um, and by the way, I kind of like how this is written, because if you notice, it's been list just listing damage all along, and then when you get this, you realize, oh, nobody else had a bonus in their strength. Because nobody else got a bonus to their damage. So it's not unusual. It's not impossible to play a character that doesn't have tons of bonuses. Nobody else had a bonus. Only Morgan does, and that's kind of awesome. So she kicks butt. She kills the Hobgoblin. Uh, the DM decides to do another morale check for the Hobgoblins before they go. Um, um, he lowers it down to seven now, because remember, you can go down to a minus two. Uh, and rolls an eight, so the last three Hobgoblins are like, nah. And they give up, right? We surrender. Uh, we'll tell you all about this room. If you don't kill us, the Hobgoblins, uh, it says if the Hobgoblins had made the morale check, they'd fight to the death. Because once they make three checks, I think, they, they fight to the death. So Silverleaf, of course, is the interpreter, remember, because nobody else speaks Hobgoblin. He tells the party, everybody agrees, they tie them up, right? Then it says, the helpful Hobgoblins not only tell the party where the treasure is, but how to avoid the poison needle trap, which, is the guards, which guards the locked chest. This also informs the DM reading this that you have the hobgoblins surrender and say they're going to tell everything, then you probably should do that. Like, don't be a dick and be like, oh yeah, the hobgoblins tell you exactly where the chest is, and then there's a trap and it kills the whole party. Like, that's kind of a dick move, you know? So, don't do that. It doesn't say that, but it says that, right? But then this part is really important. Before the party leaves, they gag the hobgoblins, making sure that no alarm is raised. Morgan is neutral alignment and argues that it's not safe to leave a short enemy behind them, even if they're helpful, helpless. Silverleaf, also neutral, but he believes the hobgoblins are too terrified to do anything. If Morgan wants to kill the prisoners, that's fine, but he's not going to get involved in that. Right, that's Silverleaf. Sister Rebecca, on the other hand, is lawful. She's shocked by Morgan's suggestion. She tells Morgan that a lawful person keeps their word, and that she promised the hobgoblins that they would not be spared. And this is the beautiful part of role-playing right here. Her god would never allow her to heal somebody who killed a helpless prisoner. Okay? Uh, Morgan agrees killing captives is wrong and that it was only the great pain from her wound which caused her to say such things. Sister Rebecca casts Cure Light Wounds on Morgan. Boom. Right? That shows us how alignment works in a really simple way. And also how you can have like an inner party strife and have this conversation. You know, it, it's not like, oh, I'm lawful. You can't do that. I'm going to smash you with my mace. It's, you know, no, I'm lawful. Uh, you know, you're a great warrior, but like, I can't heal you. Why would my God of peace and love uh, or truth or whatever their God is, right? Allow me to heal somebody who goes against that. And that's important, right? If you have some scumbag player, sorry. <laughs> Uh, sorry, Morgan, you know, who does that stuff, you should, you're fully in your rights as a law, as a lawful cleric to be like, man, I'm going to heal you. And if you're a chaotic uh, cleric, you could not heal the lawfuls because you feel like it's, it, it may be they're not going, not doing what you want. You can use that as a way to uh, breed interesting role play in the party. So that's just B28 uh, combat, right? And like I say, when, when I read this, so th from three rounds of combat and a little bit of role play before, we learn a lot about how the game should be played, at least, you know, at the table of the well, Mulvey, who is, who is the editor, right? This is, this is how he believed and how his experience was the game should be played. It should be loose. The DM should be able to, to, to make quick rulings when it makes sense, right? Uh, players should uh, interact with the creatures and try not to always just fight them and kill them. But if combat happens, there should always be a chance throughout combat that they might give up. And when negotiations are made, again, alignment and role-playing comes into to play as far as how the party moves forward. 
So let me know what you guys think. If, uh, if, if, if this interests you, if you think this is actually a worthwhile topic, how you learned, like, and, and do you think that this way of playing makes sense? Or are you, are you more like, no, 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 rules only, you shouldn't do this? Or, let me know. You know, maybe you also might interpret something completely different. And maybe there's somebody different, a different Gary than I was thinking. But I'm pretty sure it's Gary Gag at this point. Anyways, there's another uh, exploration uh, example of play, and I will definitely uh, do a video about that one coming up when I have another chance to sit down. And I'll make other videos like this as we keep going. So if you guys have questions or you want to talk about something, we'll get a little conversation going. Go ahead and put comments below. And I will see you next time.